right. Um, and it does come to the, to the Empowered Youth Conference that's coming up. Of course, Daniel will give that parents, head up to that meeting after church. We certainly don't want finances or anything to hinder any of the teens that want to go from going. I think it'll be a, be a help to them and a help in their life. And, and uh, um, so make sure to attend that meeting. And, and um, we, uh, we don't want, again, any, anybody for financial reasons um, not to send a teenager who would like to go. We, we'll certainly help with that. All right, Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Actually, let me start off with, I might go to Deuteronomy first, and then I'll come back to Joshua. Let me see here. I've been going back and forth with this to launch. And yeah, I think we'll start in Deuteronomy chapter 1. I'll just read the one verse there, and I'll come back to Joshua chapter 14 later. Deuteronomy chapter 1, and I'll read just one verse. I'll read 3. I'm going to start back up in verse 34 to get context of it. It says, And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and was wroth, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these uh, e- one of this evil generation see the good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he had trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly do love you. Lord, I thank you for your word. I ask your blessing now upon the message. Lord, I pray you control what I say and how I say it. Please use this to be a help, Lord. I certainly need you. I need your help. So I pray you be with my mind, help it to be able to concentrate and to think clearly on the truth that is here. And Lord, that you would work and use it to strengthen us and change us. Again, Lord, I love you. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Joshua, of course, is, is an, lived an incredible life when you think about it. Really is amazing, even as we're... We saw in Deuteronomy chapter 1 giving a reference to a major event in his life back when he was one of the 12 spies who went into the land to spy out the land. And of course only him and Joshua coming back with a faithful report with their eyes on God and not on the giants and not on the circumstances. Throughout Caleb's life you see he's a man of courage, a man of boldness. If I remember right I believe the name Caleb even means courage. I'm not sure but I think that's true. Um... He is a man, what I, what I, in, what I, I think one of the things that I admire most about Caleb, and as we get a glimpse, just really a small glimpse of his life really in the Bible, he always wanted to show faith in God. He wanted it to be, for others to witness it, not for him. He, he was never about himself. He wanted others to see God work. He wanted to show faith in God. It's almost like when you, when you read with what's going on with his life, like he wanted to show God, I believe you. I believe you. And with that faith, again, came the measure of courage, came a measure of boldness in his life. He was a man that when we look at his life overall, he certainly was never, ever content with being average. And that just plagues us today. In all aspects of life, just being content to be average. That certainly was not Caleb. He was not content to be nominal in his walk with God. He was not content to be nominal in his position that he had within a nation of Israel. He had a genuine and true desire for God. And a desire for God to show himself strong in his life. Again, and that was never about Caleb. That was always about God being glorified through his life. Look over in Joshua chapter 14 now. Now let me turn there. It 
says in verse 6, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgah, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, uh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when, the, uh, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again, as was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me may the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance." And thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he has said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now. For war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore, give me this mountain. Wherefore the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Amazing. I mean, here he is in Joshua chapter 4, the dividing of the land. And Caleb comes up before Joshua. He wants to remind him, hey, let's not forget what was promised me. He's 85 years old. Maybe he was worried that Joshua would think, listen, you're 85, you you know, we'll, we'll, we'll... We'll pass this on, we'll still keep it in the tribe, but you're 85 years old now, and, and, and he was going to have none of it. He went to Joshua himself, he said, you remember the promises of God, you remember what God said, I know I'm 85, and he said, but give me this mountain. The mountain would be difficult in and of itself to develop, but this is where the giants were. This is where the Anakims were. They were in this mountain. This would be challenging with who was there, the way the cities that were there existed, the battles he would face, the giants he would take on. He doesn't ask for the easy road. He doesn't ask to retire. He doesn't ask to quit. He doesn't ask for the road with less work. He doesn't say, listen, I have lived my life. I am done. Give it to the young men. Let them see God work. He says, no, I want God to be glorified in my life. I want this mountain. He asked for something that was challenging. Not because he desired work. He wasn't afraid of work, obviously, but that's not why. He desired for God to be glorified through his life. And in his mind, how could he get more glory than the oldest man present heading into the promised land? The oldest one. And taking on the hardest challenge. In his mind, there was just no better way it was of the years he had left that God could get glory. Again, like we looked at this morning, when he saw a challenge, he saw an opportunity. So often we see the challenges and we just focus on it. And it's just drudgery in our mind and drudgery. And it tears us down and it tears us down. Instead of actually seeing an opportunity for God to be glorified. Caleb saw how God could be glorified. Joshua, give me that mountain. Don't cheat me. Remember what God told us. He used his servant Moses. Remember, he said, I can have it. I want it. He asked for something that others would know. God did this. So what made Caleb the way he was. I mean, we can look at all the common denominators with all the people present. With the nation of Israel. He's there coming out of Egypt. 
Witness the plagues. Witness the parting of the Red Sea. The feeding in the wilderness. The manna from heaven. So did probably a million other people. What was different about this guy? I mean, there was something different about him. God is no respecter of person. It isn't that God just said, listen, I'll let everybody else be average, and I'll just pick one. Everybody heard the same teaching? They, all of them witnessed Moses. They all heard Moses speak. But something was different about this man. So much so that when he's 85 years old, he says, I want this mountain. I still want God to be glorified with my life. We see a few things in the book of Joshua about the life of Caleb that I believe made him different. One of the things that is true with him, I touched on this morning... In verse 6 and 7 of Joshua chapter 14, he said this, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgah, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the uh, Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me. Look what he's going back to. He said, Joshua, you know, you know what the Lord said concerning me. You know what this man would go to often? He remembered the promises of God. He held on to it. Please think with me for a minute. We read these books in a matter, as we're going through the passages here, as you're going through the book of Joshua, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you're through them in probably two months, all of them. It's nothing for us. We read it. But think where Joshua is. He's 40 years old. He finally gets out of Egypt. He's seeing God's provision and God's miracles. He is so excited to get into the promised land. He gets chosen as one of the 12 spies to go and spy out. He's one one of two that come back and say, man, we could do this. The battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. But they listened to the tin and they melted the heart of the people and they didn't go in. And listen to me, because of a lack of faith of the others, The guy wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Think of that. 40 years, Joshua is there. Now listen, here's a clue to the success of this man's life. 40 years! Think anybody could have complained, it could have been Joshua. I am here with these faithless, these idiots. I mean, faithless! Lord, I believe you. Now here I am wandering, wasting the years of my strength. Just going through and going through. He could have got bitter. He could have said, you know what? This is it, I'm done. By the way, if if that happens, when it comes to the division of the land, he doesn't go to Joshua. Joshua. If anything, he goes to him and says, listen, give it to somebody else. Because of the lack of faith of everyone else, I'm done. He never allowed bitterness to come in. And here's the biggest clue that gives you. It's not about bitterness. It's not about anger. It's what protected him from it. What it shows you is this. Is that, when, especially as Josh was going back to the promise that God gave to Moses to give to him. For Caleb... It wasn't about the land. It wasn't about the mountain. It wasn't about the giants. It was about God. That never changed. Forty. It didn't matter if he's 40 years in the wilderness. His life was about God. He didn't get in her God. Now look, I can't do it. I'm stuck here. No, it didn't matter. This is what God has. So be it. It's about him. It's about him. When you begin to make it about you, you put actually, without maybe consciously doing it, you put conditions on how you will serve God. Just like Paul, Joshua, to me, he's almost the Paul of the Old Testament. He, it doesn't matter to him. If he's in prison, 
If he's not, it's about God. I mean, we see this throughout his life. From the time we're introduced to him in Scripture, I mean, the one saying, the one who said, going back to the book of Numbers, chapter 13, we are well able to overcome. I mean, the majority of the people saw great giants with a little God. And Caleb was just the opposite. He saw little giants with a great God. And he knew there's no way we could lose. Understand, with how Caleb viewed life, this is what faith does. It changes your perception of life. It changes the perception of your circumstances, which affects the decisions you make, which affects the joy you have. When Caleb saw the giants, he didn't think of his strength. Oh, I got this new sword. I am tearing into them. I got a new bow I've been practicing with. I got this. Never crossed his mind. When he saw the giants, what he thought was, oh, wow, God is going to be glorified in this. Look what he did. He put giants here on purpose so everybody can fear God. It wasn't about him. It was about God being glorified. Why the majority of the people were simply mindful of the problems and mindful of the giants. Caleb's perception because of faith was so different. What the giants brought to his mind wasn't difficulty. It was God's power. Because he believed this was of God's promise to go here. It's God's will. And, I mean, think what the guy witnessed. I brought this up, preached on the Red Sea the other day. I mean, he, he walked through the Red... Oh, this was at the Men of Faith. He went through the Red Sea. Do you think that had an effect on this man? I mean, again, a million people witnessed it, but it had an effect on so few. And listen, the whole key was the multitudes were so obsessed with with self. They're missing the greatness and the power that's all around them. So much so, they got tired of manna from heaven. I mean, bags of Doritos falling from the sky. (laughs) Caleb had to wait 40 years. 40 years. But there's no change in the man. Because it was never actually about the land. It was about God. And now he's like, God's going to get even more glory. (laughs) I'm now 85, Joshua. Give it to me. And just like he says, everybody's going to know this isn't me. Look, that's, I I, I mean, mean, this is the, the oldest man literally in the congregation is Caleb. And he can't wait for God to get glory out of it. Because the bigger the challenge He knew the bigger God's going to get glory. And because he actually believed by faith, I don't really have to do much. I just have to trust God. So Caleb was a man with faith that truly grabbed a hold of God's promises. And it affected his perception of life. Number two, we saw this in both places we read, and it's stressed about the life of Caleb, that he wholly followed the Lord. His commitment to the Lord was genuine, and it was real. It was all of him. God had all of this man. Isn't it, a, I mean, it's, it's incredible to think about what God can do with any person who decides, Lord, you have all of me. Every bit. Lord, you have all of me. To have that level of commitment, of surrender to the Lord of recognizing what else has the heart. What is it that hinders from God having 
uh, from you wholly following God. We have to see the greatness of God, which Caleb saw, and the privilege to be a servant. Again, think of what's destroying it today because we're making everything about us today, even in church services. Instead of it being about God and how great He is and us as servants and, 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 and the picture that the New Testament gives us of a bond servant. He saw it as a privilege to serve the Creator. Because of this commitment of wholly following God, Caleb was clearly different from the others. He stood out. Let me ask you this. In your family, at work, do others see a difference in your life? Now listen. The time they will recognize the difference the most is when the giants are present. That's when your family, those co-workers, your neighbors will see the difference. When it's difficult. Caleb stayed with this commitment his entire life. He is another example of somebody could say in his last day, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He didn't, again, he didn't want to conquer the giants because of his new bow and arrow. Because of the new sword he got. Or because of how proficient he was with it. He wanted it so God could get glory. Remember when we went through the book of Revelation. And one of the... I, I, and we went through the, the seven churches there. And all of them stood out for me for different reasons. I greatly enjoyed that section of study in going through the, the churches that are mentioned in Revelation there in Asia Minor. But the first one, Ephesus. Man. The first one. That was a strong church. It, had, it had really had the, the potential to have just as much of an effect on the world as the church at Antioch did. And that church had an incredible effect on the world. We're going to see that when we get into the series on the Word of God. Ephesus had that potential. They had the right doctrine. They kept evil out. But they did something so great that the Lord Jesus Christ warned them, I will remove your candle. You had better straighten this. What was it? They lost their first love. They forgot what it was all about. It wasn't simply about the doctrine. It wasn't just about removing the evil. All those things were, were, were accommodations of the Lord. Yes, I'm glad. Do it. But you forgot it's about me. It is about loving God. Caleb held on to that. We don't want to be like those in Revelation 2 who lost their first love. Look what Caleb says in verse 10 and 11. Here's something else that made him different. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. As he said... These 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spake his word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. I'm 85. As yet, I am as strong this day as, as I was in the day of Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so is my strength now for war, both to, both, both to go out and to come in. Know what he's reminding himself on in this moment? He's 85. He says, you know what? Look, I'm doing great. I mean, I mean, God has blessed him. He is seeing God's faithfulness in his life. For the time God gave the promise 45 years earlier. He says, I want to honor God with this. Look at the position he's put me in. He 
dwelt upon the faithfulness of God in his life. So often we just, again, we just dwell on the difficulties and the problems and the messes. And you forget the faithfulness of God in your life. Where he has blessed. You'll give that two seconds of thought and then on everything else, Caleb wasn't that way. He says, look, I'm so thankful. Please give me this mountain. I want to honor God with how faithful he's been to me. Again, he just didn't dwell on the other million people that ruined his life. (laughs) Which is how he could have looked at it. But he never did because it was never about his life. He remembered God's faithfulness to him. And listen, all of us need to do that. As Ecclesiastes, when we were in that book, remind us, remember now the creator in the days of thy youth. So as I conclude this, we too, with our Christian life, let's commit. Let's take it serious. Commit to that higher ground. Lord, give me whatever mountain that will glorify you. Lord, that's what I want. Whatever mountain will glorify you, give it to me. That's what I want. With heads bowed and eyes closed. First, let me ask this. Perhaps, I know we don't have any visitors here this evening, but maybe still this thing of salvation has been bothering you. Anyone here say, Pastor, please, it is bothering me. Please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that I've been born again. Please pray for me. If that you, would you just raise your hand for me? All right, Christian. We have a flesh that likes to keep us down, loves to keep us down. And we do lose sight of the great God and all the blessings and faithfulness that he has been to you. His goodness in your life, the strength that he has given. I'm sure it's convicting for all of us. I know it is to me. When we think of how it described Caleb over and over, he wholly followed the Lord. That's the key. Don't play a game with it. Make it about him. It's a decision you will never, ever regret. It's the decision that carries you through the storms, as we saw this morning. It's the decision, even when facing something difficult, you want it. So God can be glorified. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you come and respond. Father in heaven, bless this invitation, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Page 571, 571, if you need to come and pray, come and pray.